Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. This is the story of a women's movement, a father-daughter collaboration, and a research project that is taking a new methodological path, driven by the question of how improbable movements happen and what makes people stick with them over time. We'll talk today about what made a group of teenagers in southern Brazil start a women's movement their families were convinced would fail, and how their movement transformed women's lives across the region, securing new rights and changing the terms of conversation in rural homes. From the beginning, leaders of this movement took on issues of class and gender at the same time. Protest movements have newly gained media and public attention, with the Arab Spring, the Chilean student movement, indigenous protests in Peru and Ecuador, the Occupy encampments, and more. In our research, we show that by understanding on an individual and cultural level the tensions that drive a movement forward and how gender shapes the texture of activism over time, we can better understand how movements arise and endure. Our project started almost nine years ago when we spent a summer doing research together on a women's movement in a small town in southern Brazil. This was a movement started in the mid-1980s by women in their teens and early 20s who had grown up on farms and refused to live the silenced lives their mothers lived. They founded a movement to fight for legal rights like maternity leave and pensions and for more equality and voice in their own homes. We've gone back and forth together to these towns in Brazil since then and continued our conversations and engagement with activists about how new rights for women were first established in Brazil's constitution and then implemented on the ground, and what happened to make activism such a central part of daily life in this region of Brazil. I'd like briefly to sketch out our argument. First, being a father-daughter team gave us access to the personal and internal lives of women in a way that researchers rarely achieve. As father and daughter, we were able to get to the intersection of personal life and political activism to the internal struggles that are an integral part of public politics. This access enabled us to understand and analyze what a movement is from the inside, what makes it happen and endure in terms of textures and glues. We show how a counterpublic is formed, a counterpublic of women being citizens in new ways, and we document the hardships and harms that accompany grassroots political activism for women. This is indeed one of our main goals in the project and in writing this book, to portray these internal, emotional, and political dynamics and give them density and weight in understanding politics. Third, this access to the internal dimensions of activism enabled us to shed light on a question that is central to Brazil and Latin America. Why, as democracy endures, does the presence and power of social movements seem to diminish? It's easy to assume that as electoral competition and participation in government become options, activists leave social movements to take on these other functions, with movements demobilizing accordingly. Our research, however, shows that women activists want to participate in both domains, continuing to support the women's movement as they participate in government, and that they value doing so. So the issue is more complicated. It's not involvement in elections and governing per se that makes balancing democratic participation and grassroots activism extremely difficult, but rather particular historical and cultural processes that prevent vibrant movements from straddling this divide. Alongside these historical and institutional constraints on continued social movement activism, the internal paradoxes and tensions that have long been at the heart of the women's movement make sustaining activism through years of democratic opening particularly difficult. Fourth, once we discern the factors at play in limiting or challenging social movement activism, we ask what might enable social movements to continue to play a role in pressing for fuller reform and broader citizenship in democracies. To answer this question, we develop the concept of movement in democracy. Fifth and finally, in our book, we discuss the ways in which our new forms of research blur conventional, professional, and personal boundaries so that we and our research both change in the course of this project. We won't talk a lot about methodology in the formal part of the talk, but we'd be happy to answer questions about our collaboration in the question and answer. One of the things that happened in our collaborative work was that over time, this ceased to be a project I was doing on the side, not real research, this thing I was doing in my with my daughter. Rather, I came to see 
that this was uncharted territory in terms of research methodology and scholarly findings. Being a father-daughter team gave us access to something that otherwise remained hidden. Writing is one of the ways we communicate our findings. Our book is an encounter between scholarly writing and narrative nonfiction. On the academic side, when we say that, we mean writing that poses a problem, compares cases, identifies factors that influence outcomes, and establishes a framework or contributes to theory. On the creative nonfiction side, we mean writing that has more narrative momentum, that is intellectually engaging and thoughtful, but accessible to people without prior knowledge of a field. In addition to including our distinct voices, this book is an effort to combine these two forms in a self-consciously experimental way. Part of what we are doing that narrative nonfiction does is bring individual people and their trajectories and worlds more fully into view, and we'll also do that in this talk. The women of Ibirayaras and Sananduva are what drew us in. We wanted to let readers engage with these people in as close as the way we did as we could. To do that, we look not only at what animated and enchanted their activism, but also at what made their work hard, deeply, personally hard, and what made them stick with it. What does it mean to propose an alternative vision of the world while immersed in daily unfairnesses that are slow to change? Through accounts of individual women's lives and the meetings and mobilizations where they came together, we illustrate the paradoxes that make movements move. We describe the enchantment of activism, the construction of a counterpublic infused with a vision of the future, as well as with meanings and emotions in the present that sustain activism and propel it forward. We learned over the course of our interviews that the empowerment the women's movement fosters is intertwined with the silencing of speech and with political cultures of hierarchy. This shaped other central questions in our research, such as how do movements contain difference and provide spaces for speech and dissent for forms of internal democracy? Does this involve maintaining some sort of internal pluralism or dividing up into a separate efforts and organizations? Does it mean doing politics in the streets with social movements or in the institutions? How do movements keep moving to sustain democratic citizenship? The context of our story is the arc of political change that has occurred in Brazil since the early 1980s. In 1964, Brazil experienced one of Latin America's first brutal and long-lasting military coups of the second half of the 20th century. The military then ruled Brazil until 1985, 21 years, through repression, torture, the silencing of anyone who tried to speak out, and the manipulation of institutions of political representation. Today, in contrast, Brazil's president is a leftist woman, once a member of a guerrilla opposition. Dilma Rousseff, like her predecessor Lula, presides over an increasingly democratic society in terms of the procedures of democratic government, as well as a growing economy with relatively inclusive, if also limited, social welfare programs. Brazil is perhaps the preeminent example in the world today of a transition from democracy, from dictatorship to democracy that has been accompanied by economic growth and lessening inequality. We frame our research around how astonishing this 25-year trajectory has been, something we see in the lives of activists in Rio Grande do Sul, the state where we've done our research, who've seen their mobilizations and commitment to political change and social justice, despite obstacles and moments of repression and danger, bear fruit over decades. At the same time, we frame our analysis around how much is at stake in what happens next. Brazil continues to be a highly unequal country, one of the most unequal in the world, with very uneven rule of law, often poorly functioning institutions, and high levels of violence, including the occupation and policing of favelas in Rio de Janeiro in preparation for the World Cup and the Olympics. From this troubling perspective, if there aren't significant deepening socioeconomic reforms in Brazil, along with meaningful expansions of what citizenship means on the ground, then Brazil's moment of political openness and economic success might turn around on a dime. That's why the issue of reform and activism that we study matters so much. This research involved multiple visits to two towns in the southern Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul, starting in 1997 and ending in 2012. Emma first met the women and visited Ibirayaras in Sananduva in 2001-2002 when we were living in Brazil as a family and I was doing research on a number of different social movements. And our joint research in this project began in 2004. 
The material in the book is based on many weeks of participant observation and more than 50 in-depth interviews between one and three hours in length, most of them videotaped with women's movement leaders and participants, women who do not participate in the movement, family members of women's movement activists, priests, nuns, politicians, union leaders, academics, and staff members of local NGOs. We said several times we're going to bring you inside the lives of individual activists, and we're getting there. But to start with, I want to talk a little bit about the history of this women's movement. In 1985, women in their teens, together with women of their mother's generation, <coughs> formed local groups in small towns in the interior of Rio Grande do Sul, the southernmost state in Brazil. They called these groups Mulheres da Rosa, or farm women. Four years later, these groups joined together to form a statewide movement, which they called the Movement of Rural Women Workers. And then in 2003, that movement linked up with movements in other states to form a national rural women's movement. In this talk, when I use the term women's movement, I'm referring to the statewide movement, which is what we studied. This movement formed at a time when youth were being politicized by priests and nuns, influenced by liberation theology, many themselves from this region. It was the nuns who pressed women to see themselves as bearers of rights and to think about a world where they could have greater economic equality and also greater voice in their homes. Women talk about the nuns coming to their houses to convince them to get involved in local activism and then convincing their parents, using the credibility that nuns and priests had in these towns to convince parents it was okay and important for their teens to be involved in activism. The activism of priests and nuns in this region incurred in tandem with other grassroots movements, one, occurred, one seeking to make government-sponsored unions more democratic, Another, the movement of landless people, the MST, a land takeover movement. And in fact, this region of Brazil, this part of Rio Grande do Sul, was a hotbed of radical organizing during the years of transition from dictatorship to democracy. And the women's movement itself became active regionally and nationally during a period when Brazil's post-military constitution was being written. And the movement joined with other women's groups across the country to press for the inclusion in the constitution of rights for women. And this indeed occurred in the 1988 Constitution. But what the leaders in the movement found was that having rights on paper didn't mean having those rights in reality. And this led to a 10-year process of the movement fighting for the implementation of these rights to things like maternity leave and pension. So trying to figure out how do you get rights written into the Constitution, and then how do you make those rights real? How do you give people access to them? One example of the ways that the movement tried to give people access to rights was that even after the implementation process was in place, movement leaders realized that a lot of women in these small towns didn't have birth certificates. And without, without a birth certificate, no amount of legal rights does you any good because you can't access them. So they ran buses across the countryside, bringing women to cities where they could sign their name for birth certificates, which would give them access to these newly won rights. These were milestone achievements, and by the mid-1990s, these rights to maternity leave and pensions were secured. And as these historic battles were won, women's movement activists had to figure out what the next steps were, what they focused on moving forward with regard to economic rights and to gender issues. In some ways, this was a new stage for the movement, when what to fight for, what to focus on, was no longer clear. And there was still so much need for change, but less certainty and certainly less agreement about where and how to fight for that change. So what happens when the regime is toppled, or in our case, after new constitutional rights to pensions and maternity leave have been implemented, at least initially? In the first long struggle to oust the military from power and establish new rights, it's often possible for many different people and groups to unify around a core set of demands to oust dictators, to establish rights to participation, to implement basic new rights. What movements experience next is often new uncertainty and real disagreement about goals. In the case of the rural women's movement, what's the most important next step? Is it a fair distribution of land, which involves expropriation and redistribution, as well as close cooperation with the MST, Brazil's movement of landless people? Should the next goal be a new regional economy based on community projects and local solidarity? What about issues pertaining specifically to women? Should women's health be the main goal, focusing on pressing the government to implement its promised universal health care system, or gender discrimination and violence against women, or getting men to do the dishes and everything such a goal 
symbolized and entails. So in this new context, after the dictatorship has fallen and once a new constitution and the most basic democratic procedures and constitutional rights are at least in some sense in place, in this new context, there's likely to be a lot of disagreement regarding what a progressive social movement should be. How will its goals and strategies of mobilization and confrontation be adapted to a context of competitive elections and new institutions? And then there's the issue of internal democracy, of how social movements formed in the heat of highly dangerous conflict make decisions about how to proceed in a new context. Will it be possible to contain plurality and difference within one movement? And should that even be the goal? What first drew me into this movement were the stories of individual women. What had led them to become activists in their teens? How they had navigated this path, how to be a movement in a democracy, what role they wanted to play individually and what they wanted their movement to fight for. And, and beyond what drew us in initially, we really believe that to understand a movement as a whole, to understand social movements, it's essential to understand the decisions, the tensions, the choices, the pain, the embarrassment, the questions that drive individuals over time, and, and what it means to put yourself out there as an activist, even when that's not accepted in your home. I'll speak first about Monica Marchesini. This will be first in a series of women we'll speak about. She lives on a small farm with her five children and her husband, four kilometers from the center of town, and they don't own a car. She makes everything that her family eats except for sugar, salt, and coffee. And she goes into town occasionally to buy those items to go to church and when her husband will let her to attend women's movement meetings. We learned from Monica that making change is about changing people, not just about fighting for power. And change on a personal level, changing yourself, changing your family, is really hard. We learned from Monica about the paradox and the pain that comes from envisioning a different world while remaining deeply immersed in the reality of your daily life and how at times that tension, that gap between what you envision and what you live can actually drive your activism forward. So what do I mean by that gap? During our first days in Monica's kitchen, we would often go and spend the day in her kitchen or have her show us around her farm. I remember thinking that she was contradicting herself left and right. She would stand at the sink doing dishes while her husband sat on the couch and she would say, men also eat food, men also tracked her into the house, they should help with the dishes, they should help clean up. But it was very clear that that never happened in her house and she was saying that while she washed the dishes. She would say things like, I can't wait for my daughter to grow up so there's someone to help me with the housework. But she had four grown sons and I just remembered her saying that men should also help with all of those things and that boys can also help. So at first it seemed like she was being hypocritical. And then I realized over time, both speaking with Monica and other leaders of the movement, that Monica was being, was saying, what she was saying was contradictory, but she wasn't being hypocritical. She lives in the space of contradiction. At women's movement meetings, she talks about how men should help with the housework. She talks about how women should have equal legal rights and equal voice in their families. She talks about how teenage sons should help around the house. But then she goes home, and those things are really slow to change. And those are often harder to change than legal rights. It's often, it's often easier in some ways personally, people, women, these women said, to take a bus for hours and hours and go to the capital city of Brazil and protest for legal rights than it is to keep pressing your husband to change when he's resisting you at every turn. And so Monica saying aloud what she wanted to have happening in her house, what she thought should happen in front of her family was in a way a form of fighting for change. But it's also hard to constantly be faced with what's unfair, to constantly be talking about, thinking about at women's movement meetings while you're doing the dishes, how someone else should be helping you, how things should be different, even as they are so slow to change. And I think that this gap is part of what moves Monica forward, part of what keeps her committed to the movement over time, even though the results are slow and difficult to measure. Because she's faced every day with what she's fighting for and what she's fighting against. And that keeps her committed because she can't lose track of why it's important, even as in some ways this holding of paradox, this holding of contradiction and tension is one of the hardest things that the women's movement asks women in this region to do. That's another photo of Monica. Izanetti Kola is an organizer for the women's movement. She goes door to door explaining to women what the movement is, 
and why they should join. Izanetti's own trajectory to activism involved leaving the countryside because it seemed like a dead end, then returning with her husband Fernando and a new vision for sustainable agriculture. Over time, with faltering steps, Izanetti found her way first to the Workers' Party and then to the rural women's movement in her town. Women in the women's movement often say that as soon as other women have their eyes opened and see the oppression around them, then they'll join the women's movement. But Izanetti knows from hard experience that that's not the case. She knocks on doors and visits and returns, but she's learned over years that women's lives are rooted in local cultures and tasks, and many women view her with suspicion or will take a few steps and then go no further. For one thing, women believe in a male god, in their own view, who counsels obedience. They distrust Izanetti for all her questioning, perhaps fearful of losing a mooring that they value and need. Women encounter numerous self-help strategies that tell them that their problems stem from their own psychologies, that to change the world they need to change their mindset and wake up with a smile. And women who take heed of Izanetti's warnings about pesticides and genetically altered crops may face husbands far less willing to change. Often, that's a dead end for women themselves and for Izanetti. It's too painful to face resistance at home. As I talked to Izanetti, she showed me piece by piece what she was up against in organizing a movement. The Catholic Church, pleasure in cooking, husbands who won't question genetically modified crops, the psychologist on the radio telling women that everything is flowers. At first, I wondered if Izanetti couldn't make the imaginative leap to understand what attracts people to these other worldviews. Yet what was most striking about our discussions, when I thought about them a bit longer, was how genuinely aware and puzzled Izanetti is by the local world in which she lives and which she seeks to change. How much there is in that world that works against her and other activists and confuses and complicates what they see to be true. We know the world and we read the world, Izanetti told me, talking about her work in her town. And things go on from there. For most of her life, when Jessie Bonas wanted to change a law, she mobilized thousands of women and bused them to cities in Brazil to protest for rights. Then, in 2002, her approach changed. She accepted a position as head of the health department in her town of 7,000. This decision, this option, would have been unimaginable when the movement first began. When to activists across Brazil, at, in the last years of the dictatorship and the first years of democracy, it seemed as if the only way to fight for change was through movements. And then, as the political landscape in Brazil shifted, activists found more opportunities in local governments and suddenly faced the question of, when there's more than one option, when there are these two different spaces that become open to you, how do you decide where to fight for change? And for Jesse, it was also a question of how, and, and for activists across the country, how when you, when you know you want to fight for change, when you see the world around you shifting, the options shifting, where, where do you go? Where do you put in your time and energy? And that was not an easy decision because things were so polarized that when she said to her colleagues in the women's movement that she was thinking about doing this work in the health department, they said, you can do that, but you won't be part of the movement anymore. They didn't say, you can't make any change from the government. They said, we just wouldn't be a movement anymore with you inside. And then when she decided to take the gamble and join the health department, a lot of her colleagues there at first said, what are you doing here? You only know how to organize. You only know how to fight in the streets. What makes you think you can come inside? And even over time, as she proved her colleagues in the government wrong, as she proved that she could use her organizing skills to transform the health department, even though she had no medical training and had studied in school only till fifth grade when she'd had to quit to help with the housework, she managed to use her organizing skills from the movement to open a 24-hour emergency room, to hire local women to serve as community health workers, and to run buses through the countryside bringing doctors and dentists to children in areas that couldn't reach the center of town. And yet she still wondered in a really deep way about whether she had made the right decision. She said, I have two hearts, one in the streets with the movement and one in the institutions with the, in the, in the, you know, in the institutions with the health department. And she was talking about more than an individual decision. She was talking about kind of the direction that activism takes and how individual choices shape that trajectory over time. <laughs> 
Vera Fracasso on the right was the first woman president of the Farmers Union in her town. What she's achieved represents one of the things that the women's movement was seeking to produce, women with roles outside the movement in the public sphere. Vera speaks eloquently about the challenges of being a woman in a man's space, bringing her own way of doing things to that space. Vera left the women's movement, however, because she couldn't play this union role and stay in the movement, whose other leaders demanded a more confrontational stance. In addition, many of the leaders of the women's movement were allying with the MST, the most radical of the social movements in the area, and the one that most insisted on a centralized political line and hierarchical forms of authority. Vera refused to join that alliance, so she left the movement. And we've had many conversations with Vera about why she simply left, rather than fight back through the electoral mechanisms by which the women's movement formally functions. Vera regrets having left without a fight. In retrospect, it's clear that neither she nor her allies in the struggle for a more inclusive movement knew how to engage in what we might call the rough and tumble of internal democracy to further their position. Instead of fighting back when consensus broke down, they left. And this is where the roles of the church and the MST, the landless workers movement, were central to the relative demobilization of some social movements in this area. The church had given young women the tools and conviction with which to challenge state power. The MST similarly had galvanized young people to occupy land and demand radical changes in its distribution. However, the church taught consensus and was itself a hierarchical organization. And the MST adopted hierarchical forms of internal practice, arguing for the need for centralized structures of authority and decision making in order to fight the power of the landowners and the state. <coughs> Neither the church nor the MST provided skills, practice, or normative support for what we'd call the rough and tumble of democracy, where you fight it out, often with unpleasantness and anger, through democratic mechanisms of debate and voting. So Vera left the women's movement rather than fighting through democratic procedures to make it a place that might accommodate her union activism. Vera speaks eloquently about the movement as a source, a fountain of inspiration. And she says that without that, you find yourself doing things you'd never imagined you'd do. Bonnie and Vanya met leading women's movement protests, traveling throughout the state, encouraging women to join the movement, and organizing meetings in small towns. They fell in love and moved in together as a couple in Ibirayaras, a small Catholic town in southern Brazil, making an alternative vision a reality in their own lives. They did not have models for this in the areas where they grew up. Their vibrant part of the social life in their town were part of the women's movement for many years, and they even share parenting responsibilities with Ivani's sister, Jessie, whose children run back and forth between the two homes. Ivani and Vanya talk about how being part of the movement, with its emphasis on alternative worlds, gave them the courage to move in together, and how living together pushed them to sustain their activism, sustain their commitment to the movement, as many women around them left. From the beginning, one of the movement's goals was to give women a space to speak about themselves. But despite repeatedly suggesting that the movement newsletter address the subject of homosexuality, no one spoke about that topic or about Ifani and Vanya's relationship in the movement, or at home. At home, while they're deeply involved with their family and community and live openly as a couple in their town, their relationship is never talked about. They live each day the paradox of exclusion in the face of tolerance and silence in the space of speech. In a way, the space that they were fighting for other women to have to speak about themselves, to speak about their relationships, their families, their hopes and fears, wasn't an open space for them. And ultimately, they left the movement as a result. The question of what space a movement has for people to talk about themselves, what stories are speakable, and what, what is pushed to the margins, that's about more than whether people stay or leave. It's about what a movement does, is, becomes, and whether it can sustain a vibrant political space and include people in decisions. It's about how much people are able to be fully themselves in movements. And that plays a role in determining the direction a movement takes over time. This is what I think of our, the story of our leaving the movement, Ivani told me when I asked her. It was the place where we worked, and it was a place where there wasn't space for us. I think that's a form of repression, that if the movement was what sustained you, the base from which you could speak, 
from which you could work, then you can't have a larger debate. You can't advance if you don't have a space there. So you have to do something. From the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s, the rural women's movement successfully unified women around a big set of shared state and national tasks and achieved them. Over the past 15 years, in contrast, women in the movement have made a variety of different choices. They've taken their activism in directions that are multifaceted and valuable and support nonviolent activism and rights for women, but that involve contrasting and at times conflicting strategies and goals. Activism in the Farmers Union was one of those directions, the one taken up by Vera. Through the unions, women could develop new agricultural practices on family farms. They could occupy leadership positions in the union and support progressive city governments, as well as work to change gender relationships at home. Alongside the unions, and often in union halls, local chapters of the women's movement have carried out a wide range of meetings and self-help activities. Many years into the movement, it was still crucial for the women to consider the constraints of their daily routines and how to alleviate them, to gather in small circles to relate the pains and hardships they faced together with family members. It was often through mischika or ceremonies at these meetings and the intimate discussions, oops, and the intimate discussions that followed that a new counterpublic of women was created. This was one of the other questions we thought about a lot. We attended many meetings of the rural women's movement, ranging from women from across the state filling a cavernous union hall to gatherings of 30 women talking about how to prepare herbal medicines. In one, women might hear a two-hour lecture entitled Gender Today that focused on the way the economic system since colonial times had impoverished Brazilian peasants. At another, they discussed what you say to your husband when you want to leave the house to go to a meeting. What words do you use when you don't want to ask permission but you also don't want to say, got a meeting, I'm out of here. How do you craft the language of dialogue between the members of a couple? These activities don't fit the usual panorama of solidarity building or consciousness raising. They often seemed odd or unconnected, ranging from the world historical on the one hand to the intensely personal. What we realized over time was that we were seeing the creation of a space of enchantment. In this space, networks of communication and the courage to speak were interwoven with emotions that enabled activism. One of the most innovative new efforts of the rural women's movement was the creation of a network of what they called women's pharmacies. In the pharmacies, women learned to prepare herbal remedies and to counsel other women on physical and mental ailments. Interestingly, the pharmacies appealed to all factions within the women's movement, from Vera and Jesse, who joined unions and municipal governments, to others who insist that the women's movement must ally with more hierarchical and male-led movements to organize in the streets. They all find value in these new, often makeshift local initiatives. Five years after beginning the pharmacy, the pharmacy women in Iberayaras were running a store called Kitanda, where they sold a whole range of local products. Kitanda has become a hub of local activity. Women in town uh, to see doctors, to deal with other bureaucratic appointments, would come by and talk there. And it was Monica quite, right there. That's Monica there. It was striking to me in one visit to the Kitanda <laughs> that I was seeing women who 20 years ago had been isolated in their homes, in towns, with no means to get to the center of the city and no way to speak of the pains or difficulties in their life to anyone. We're now in a store in the center of town, and the store had a big window. You can see that window next to the sign. Window was always crystal clear. And the women were looking out of that window over the whole town, the park, the SO station, the church, the stores, the houses in the background. And it was clear that in a major way, women who had been isolated were now right in the center looking outward. As these efforts were flourishing, the state-level directors of the women's movement united with rural women's movements in other states to form a national movement. The national movement allied with an international peasant organization, Via Campesina, using direct action tactics to press for a new agricultural model. Via Campesina, in turn, is one of the main actors in the campaign focused on the United Nations to establish, this is happening today, to establish an international accord on peasant rights. 
In one notable and controversial action on International Women's Day in 2007, the women's movement in Rio Grande do Sul occupied the laboratories of the agricultural giant Monsanto and destroyed equipment and genetically altered crops. Most strikingly, some women from the women's movement have begun using and selling Herbalife, a daily nutrition supplement, part of an empire based in LA that encourages people to be healthy, modern, and thin by replacing locally grown food with a powder you mix with water and eat for breakfast and dinner. This is sold via slick DVD presentations in people's houses and presented as a novo cocktail or a new cocktail. Now to conclude, as these multiple directions developed, the women's movement did not succeed in holding all of this activism, all of this dynamism and creativity within one overarching movement. One of the reasons for splitting apart resulted from the fact that the movement did not find a way to institute internally democratic procedures that could provide reliable decision-making methods over time. We heard and talked a lot about this. In many ways, it was a detective story finding out what had happened and why women had left the movement. The many directions that women's activism has taken are complementary and valuable. Many would say this panel represents a triumph of democracy and the successful result of the women's movement. However, the loss of broad-based mobilizing movements, when movements don't regenerate themselves and when they do not manage to create spaces for speech and mediate difference, this means the loss of sources and pressures for deepening progressive reform in democracies. But what does it mean to be a movement in democracy? It means to develop all the capacities of selfhood, speech, and mobilization that the rural women's movement forged over two decades and then go one step further, holding together that multiplicity in one movement, even if it doesn't seem to fit together. This is what our research led us to see and what we want to put on the table. A might have been that women activists puzzled about and whose absence deeply pained them. Alternately, grassroots pressure in democracy might be achieved if different groups spin off from the original organization but stay in active dialogue one with the other, openly and without hierarchy. That also didn't happen here. But that's what new movements, such as the Horizontal Neighborhood Assemblies in Argentina, the Indignados in Spain, and Occupy in the US seem to be striving for another way of being movements in democracy. So the story of democratization and deepening of citizenship and reform in Brazil is in part the story of how these women create a counter public and withstand and innovatively grapple with the intimate aspects of sustaining activism that we discuss. Citizens, we argue, need movements in democracy to gain and expand rights and justice. And democracies need movements in order to remain vibrant and deepen. Thank you. And we would be delighted to respond to questions about the movement, about what we've talked about, about what it was like to do this as a father-daughter team, about the uh, sort of methods and implications of this method for carrying out research. Um, yeah, I'm really curious about how being a father and daughter affected um, the way you carry out your research and how you know the women that you were um, working with, how that affected them. It's a great question. It's one we wonder about, too, because in some ways we can make our best guess about how it affected them. It's hard to know. For sure, in terms of how in the beginning, working together shaped what we did. We, we come at this work with different questions, with different backgrounds. Um, it's, it's, I think, pretty uncommon for people to collaborate at such different ages and, and life experiences. So on, a, on the most basic level, we were always asking different questions and noticing different things after meetings or after interviews. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not an uncom it's a complicated thing to, uh, a lot of these women, their stories of activism, their stories of starting the movement began with defying their fathers. Their fathers who thought women are supposed to stay home, women are supposed to ask permission to leave the house. So defying their fathers in order not only to leave the house to go to women's movement meetings, but to transform the landscape of, of gender relations and women's rights. So I think there was a sense of seeing in us part of the kind of dialogue that perhaps they were working towards, um, and also seeing in us kind of the reality of two people working together, which is that we also argued and disagreed and had to figure out how to make decisions as a team. In, in some ways, I think that 
going together gave us greater access because we seemed more real. That people were letting us into their lives, into their families, into their kitchens, and to be around when, not only for kind of formal interviews, but also just for hanging out and talking to them in all different moments. And in a way, because we were two people and each of us had brought a little bit of our home life with us in, by bringing the other, I think that it perhaps, I imagine, might have made it more comfortable to have us around. Mm -hmm. These are also women who uh, didn't leave when they discovered or realized or decided they wanted to fight against the constraints they felt as girls and women in their lives. They, they could have presumably left and gone to the city or to other towns and said, we're going to make a new life somewhere else. They were deeply committed to staying where they were and making where they were a place that could sustain them economically, but also where their mothers and they themselves could be in more equal relationships and could have a voice and a, a sense of selves and a voice in their homes and in their families. So I think, in a sense, performing father daughterness of in whatever way we were doing it in that context was engaging in dialogue in some ways with their staying and with sort of what it was that they were trying to achieve while they were staying. They were always very, uh, uh, these are topics of discussion. What does it mean to talk about bringing up boys and girls equally? What do equal gender roles mean? Women very much didn't have answers to those questions, but the posing of questions was part of their practice of being women, of being women activists, and of being sort of political activists more generally. So I think our father-daughterness kind of put something right there in play. But it's a question that we hold, hold with us because we have to know for sure. A little louder. Sorry. Why did you choose to focus on southern Brazil as opposed to the Amazon? And the second question is, is there any racial dimension to the women movement in Brazil? Southern Brazil, uh, largely because this particular region of Brazil had been one of the cradles or, or origin points for the kinds of grassroots activism that became so prominent in Brazil at the end years of the dictatorship in the 70s and 80s. So it was this was a place where several different kinds of activism were happening. There was neighborhood activism happening in the capital city of the state, Porto Alegre, where urban neighborhood movements were forging a kind of participatory budgeting, a kind of local control over the city budget that was part of a long-term project of the Workers' Party. The movement of landless rural workers, or MST, about which I spoke and which had such implications for both Brazil and for political activism in this region, also formed uh, in this area or in the sort of the southern three states. So I, I went to do research and, and brought my family with me to look at that whole set of uh, forms of activism. I also knew about the women's movement and, and their sort of combining of gender and class controls con concerns so centrally from the beginning. So that was what brought me there, that this was a place of multiple kinds of activism and a story to, to tell about that, that it impacted dramatically in the trajectory of national change in Brazil. Uh, in terms of the racial I dimension- say I ended up there sorry. because he brought our whole family there and I got interested. <laughs> This is one of the whitest states in Brazil. It was largely settled by uh, poor uh, immigrants from uh, Poland, Germany, and Italy in the late 19th and early 20th century. So the uh, women are largely uh, paler skinned, blonder than would be characteristic of most other states in Brazil. Uh, and the, the attention to race that has been surfacing in the capital city has been surfacing less in this region. It's a real puzzle to us how and what would have happened had we focused more explicitly on race. There was no obvious exclusion of Afro-Brazilian women. There was no obvious racial stratification in this movement. But just as it's our methodology to get beneath the surface, to go to the margins, and ask questions about how are things framed and who's included and excluded, uh, we think there might have been a broader story to tell if we'd been able to bring race into it in a way, in a way that we didn't. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and you captured a great deal of the spirit and the, uh, uh, of uh, Brazil in the last 25 years in this small region, uh, uh, giving us a window on, on the process of democratization and the common throughout. Um, so I have first an empirical question and then a comment. And the critical question for you is, you spoke a great deal about the demobilization. Uh, but I wonder a bit more empirically, what happened uh, to the women's movement, to the state movement? So you talked about individuals leaving. 
but I didn't get a sense of the movement statewide. So is this a, has it demobilized, has it disintegrated, or have these individuals left but the movement continues in other forms? It's a good question. Uh, so several of the leaders that we profiled and got to know from the beginning ended up leaving. So the movement certainly splintered to the extent that some of the women who had founded it and been most involved left and took other directions with their work. But the movement continues and has linked up with a national movement. And the statewide movement, this Rio Grande do Sul movement, actually played a key role in mobilizing activists across the country to form the national women's movement. In recent years, the statewide, this, this kind of now part of the national movement in, 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 in collaboration with other movements has taken in some ways a more militant approach by in one, in one example occupying, um, destroying kind of um, technology and tools in a, uh, in a, in a plant that, that works on uh, genetically altered crops. Um, in other examples kind of more direct confrontations with police or forms of civil disobedience which is a big topic of discussion among women who have left whether that's the right direction or not. Um, but the movement has very much continued just in a different form than it had in the beginning. And kind of our question was, and the reason we talk about kind of the movement, uh, um, people lo leaving the movement and what was lost was the sense of this, that what the movement looked like in the early years is very different from how it looks now. And so we're kind of interested in the question of what was lost and what has been gained as some women took very different directions and then the unified movement took um, the direction that it has to an end. It really gets us to issues of citizenship and democracy. Uh, the, the, the official women's movement with its headquarters in Paso Fundo, one of the cities in, in, in the central part of the state, has successfully linked up in a national and international way and arguably is a player in rural issues facing Brazil, uh, has recently met with Gilma Rousseff to discuss issues of domestic violence. There was a meeting a month ago. And they're also on the international scene as part of a coalition to press for peasant rights. At the same time, they have become less connected to the base of women in the countryside in Rio Grande do Sul. So there's that trade-off between how much are you going to mobilize a base and be in touch with women's concerns. And where we enter in, I would argue there's a lack of the development of an active, vibrant form of citizenship that would depend on keeping more women in a movement and making a movement more of a vibrant local initiative, either as one movement or, as I've come to think, as a set of movements that are interconnected. Neither of that happens. So, And the MST, uh, the Movement of Landless Rural Workers, is really a lightning rod in this part of Brazil for splitting people either to be more radical but also more hierarchical and part of a structure or to stay local, press for more multiplicity and democracy, but not really be able to achieve it. So that's a Rio Grande do Sul story, but I think it has a lot to say about what does it take to keep vibrant form, keep forms of activism vibrant in a democratic context, pressing for change outside the institutions as well as in them. So, so just to make my comment, then. in my own experience in Sao Paulo and in Rio, working with social movements, um, there's a sense that rather than focus conceptually on the problem of demobilization, um, it was better to focus on the issue of remobilization. Mm. So um, it's, it's somewhat unrealistic to ask people to demobilize all the time. It's, it's an incredible effort. People have lives. Their lives are hard. But, so people can move out of leadership roles, I found. Um, but then what happens when there's a new crisis in the neighborhood? Mm. And um, so I, over, if you study a place long enough, you're bound to come up with a kind of new crisis. What I've found is that, is that there's, uh, where we can say the social movements are, are vibrant, they have a great capacity to remobilize. So if there's a new eviction threat, if there's some sanitation problem, that the same people will get remobilized. Or maybe their children or, or other people will rally around. So I found that that was a, a, a better mark than demobilization, so the remobilization. But I wonder in your case whether the MST is so strong that it in a way eclipses those local issues because it tends to absorb them on its own terms. I'm going to, I think that we were adding another question to that, because I think what you're saying would be a very valid lens to look at these women's activism, the multiple forms, the, the unions, the pharmacies, the kitanda, the uh, 
take over of a, 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 a particular local installations. I suspect that is a network that, that does respond to particular instances. So my, my sense is that that would hold. Uh, we were grappling with a notion that mobilization can continue in some ways over time uh, because that seemed to be a possibility for these women. Other questions? Questions about methodology from the methodologists who <laughs> need to leave? Yeah. We didn't, and I wish we had. We talked to other men. We talked to Jesse's husband. We talked to several other men, and I don't remember having a sustained, maybe, did you talk to him on the side? I don't remember having a sustained conversation with him. He, he followed us. I mean, he was with us for a lot of the days that we spent with Monica, and of course, I should have turned to him at some point and said, well, what do you think? Should men help with the dishes? That's one of those questions that, in retrospect, would have been so interesting to know the answer to. But it, it would have interrupted something that was going on. But it, it, that would have been a complicated move to make as Monica was, was, the, uh, was, was in discussion with us. And his silence and in was, the allowing yeah. of her speech was actually quite significant. That was part of what was striking, that, she didn't, that her husband didn't speak over her. That she, for hours on end, she could talk about what she learned at women's movement meetings, walk us through the work she did on the farm, explain how hard it was, explain how much more she did than anyone else in her family, explain how she did dishes and her husband watched TV even though he should help. And he listened to her and he didn't interrupt. And she talks about moments when he d interrupts her all the time or when he tells her to shut up, that he's the one who speaks in the house, and the moments when he won't let her go to movement meetings. So it seemed like he is someone who at times takes control, takes this to the floor, and refuses to let her speak. So it was very striking that as when we were there asking about her life, he let her framing of her life stand. So I think that gives us some indication of his willingness at least to, to let exist, to allow to exist a framing of the world that's different and a framing of the family that's different from what he wants. But, but I still really wish I turned and asked him. And even, or even if it, that weren't the right moment, I think that one of the things that I want to do more than the next time we go back is talk to more of the men because we did, but not as extensively as the women. That's a good when question. you look back at research and say, what, what would we have done differently or what would we do if we were continuing this or if we do, it would be have more interviews with, with the men. The women, uh, our, our place of discussion, both of us, was focused on the women. And again, how to negotiate that differently going forward would have been something to think about. Uh, but all of the women, or, or most of them, were very clear that they were out to make changes together with men, uh, th th that they saw this as something that had to happen uh, with men engaged. And many of them were members of heterosexual couples where the men certainly uh, had, had wives who were out there working in public or in the women's movement and where the issues of complicatedness of gender relations were not in that obvious apparent uh, sort of who's working and who's not, but in who's doing what and who has authority. Uh, so that would have been really something uh, to get at that we weren't uh, that we weren't able to get at, or, or, the, or that we didn't get at in that in in that time. Uh, just parenthetically, in terms of the, the the unexpected moments of research, we did arrange a dinner with several couples where we people knew we were going to broach the subject of changing gender relations in families, and that's the meeting where Herbalife popped out of nowhere. And suddenly it turned out to a presentation on Herbalife. So that doesn't mean we couldn't have gone back and done more on gender, but oh, uh, is that what we're talking about here? So there are moments that are unexpected. Would you reflect on that on your own starting of the research? Would you frame it as uh, romanticizing the kind of working class that is South American, and oftentimes like social movement scholars have this romanticized view, and then watching closely the family dynamics. Is that the story that you're telling? So the class dynamics were great, but then the gender dynamics somehow was not so great, and just trying to throw it out there and get a sense of you and how you can reflect back on your own uh, initial hopes in the research and what you ended up with. I can start. I, I was 14, 15 when the project began, and I didn't really have a framework that I was looking at this through which I was looking at all this. In some ways, I kind of developed 
frameworks for it, or, or de developed under my own understandings of ethnography and 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 research through you know and, and and movements through this project. So in some ways, I don't. I, I, I don't know that I expected anything in particular, but I certainly was surprised at how hard families are to change. And that, I think, for me, maybe on some, some level, had I romanticized or had I had the sense that these women decided they wanted to change how people interacted with each other and then they did, yeah, it sounded a lot more straightforward when I first asked them. And what was so exciting about this research was getting inside that. What does it actually take? What, are, what is really, really, really resistant to change? And how can I learn to pause and ask people what's happening and give myself time to try to understand what's actually going on so that I am less often sitting in someone's kitchen and saying, she's contradicting herself, she's being hypocritical, nothing's really changing. When in fact, something was changing and also there was something else going on, this kind of active holding of paradox that I think is a central part of what was happening in that moment and what happens in the movement that I didn't see at first. So I certainly learned from this project something that, that may be obvious to many who've done you know, it may, it may have been obvious to you in the beginning, but to me, kind of that need to pay such close attention and to not assume you know what's happening and not to assume that you, even the second or third or fourth trip, know you know what's happening um, was, a, was a big lesson for me in this project. For me, the entry point was somewhat different because, uh, in a sense, I had had that lesson in previous research when I studied a radical Indian movement in southern Mexico whose on-the-ground practices did not in any way match the official story of the movement. So interestingly, I, in, in a sense, went to southern Brazil knowing that what I wanted to do was tell the story beyond, behind the official story or the story of what I would then have called ambiguity and contradiction. And in fact, that's what I told the women in the initial interviews that I had in the women's movement headquarters where I had to say who I was and, you know, was it going to be okay for me to study this movement? And I said I'd written this book about Mexico and it was really about sort of how activism comes out of daily life and the complexities of daily life. So in a sense, for me, that wasn't a surprise, although the book, when I write and teach about this, in a sense, I want to make it clear that there is this public story that gets told and retold about movement after movement, and the book is an effort to say that, that, that we and activists alike need a different lens uh, with which to look at movements. What was really hard and complicated always uh, as an ethnographer, as a, a social scientist, was how to make sense. Once you let in that complexity and you have an eye out for it, how do you make sense of what you're seeing? And how do you constantly press yourself to not put what you're seeing into the easiest categories? It was really hard in figuring out what was going on in all these meetings. And my ability to, or our ability to think about what was, how do we talk about the fact that at these meetings on gender today, women sit for two or three hours and hear lectures about how imperialism is destroying genetically altered crops. What does that have to do with gender today? Uh, or uh, what does it mean that the women's pharmacies, which are a very motherist agenda, are or the folk- Or seeing that way at first. Or seeing that way, that's right. So, it, and, and colleagues to whom we showed our work constantly said, you know, get your, get your skepticism, get your sarcasm, if that's what it is, get your uh, assumptions out of there. And that doesn't mean suspend all judgment, but find, find a different way of exploring what might these pieces mean and how they might add together. So I think that's even, even beyond things are not the rosy story of the social movement. The book is an effort to get into that, that place of difficulty of interpretation and also real hardship in people's lives. I think movements are hard. It, it, it's, it's, it's shameful and difficult after years to still come into this public sphere and say, I've been beaten or I'm silenced or I don't have a voice. And we wanted to get that, that loneliness of activism uh, there alongside kind of the successes of it. in all your uh, meetings, how did you actually go beyond the point where they actually start telling you stories or that you know that they've had a connection with you? How do you start, as an ethnographer, how do you start getting to know, um, you know, how do you push to get more information? One piece is time. Mm -hmm. Spending real time in a place so that you become a familiar face mm -hmm. so that people aren't immediately shifting kind of saying, oh, this person is there, we better change everything that's happening in this meeting so that it's less. And in some, to some extent, they're, all, they're always aware, of course, that you're there and things may be changing because of your pre presence, but so that it's less a performance for you and more that you can 
be there while things are happening. I, another, we, we struggled to try to figure out what questions we needed to ask. What well, we, we were famous for walking up and down the streets of this small town at six in the evening, kind of asking each other. I mean, I don't know if people knew what we were asking, but it's like, what do you ask? How do you do that? How do you elicit the kind of stories that aren't a flattened narrative right. about something that happened for understandable reasons and that has a coherent trajectory? Because one of the challenges was you would ask women how they got involved in the movement, and we would hear this very coherent, very nicely, neatly packaged political story. You know, we when we came to call kind of the official story. Well, the nuns came to my house, and then I defied my father, and we started the movement, and we gained these rights, and, and it felt like, but wait, there's got to be more to it than that. What did it feel like? What did it feel like to be 17 and defy your father? What made it seem possible? When were the moments when it seemed like all of this might fall apart? So one of the things we did sometimes was interview each other and kind of try to figure out what questions would elicit the kinds of answers we we, we had in mind and then realized after a while doing that, we realized, wait, this is maybe not the way to get there because sometimes the way we were pe people were talking to narrated their lives was different from the way we did. So a question that would have got me immediately talking about what happened at X meeting and how this hilarious joke was played on this person and how that led us to do this wouldn't necessarily for someone else. So there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of finding, for me at least, what I found most effective was kind of being around in informal moments, going over to help someone make lunch, going over to hang out with their kids and them in the afternoon. And especially for these, the kind of texture that we were looking for, that what weren't, weren't we were obviously very interested in the kind of analysis and, 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 and those kind of more thoughtful answers, but we were also interested in just kind of the details and texture of what meetings felt like. And then it was often being there in less formal moments where it could be kind of a conversation while we were doing other things. You're also listening for things that don't come from questions and that you can't plan. Uh, in one interview with Monica, she told me all about how she'd been fighting, you know, becoming part of the women's movement and understanding her life differently. And the first half of the interview was all about that. And then I don't know what happened midway through. I can't remember. We took a break. We had something, some, some kind of beverage. And then suddenly she told me that her husband was an alcoholic and how incredibly hard her life was on a daily basis. It was like, it just happened. I couldn't, no question was going to elicit that. It happened in the course of the interview. Another example would be uh, what we learned about Ivoni and Vanya, the lesbian couple, where Emma had a series of dinners with them. And again, that was in our shifting collaboration. It was Emma who went off and began to play an active role in our second and third visit in having these dinners with them. And the first long dinner about their lesbianism was the story of, uh, of the movement enabling them to move, being part of the movement enabling them to move in together, moving in together, sustaining their activism. So that's a very kind of, it's, it's an interesting and complex story, but it's, it's relatively cohesive. It was when Emma went back with a text she'd written three years later and read it to them and asked for their responses, that they started to talk about the times they had tried to speak about being lesbian in the movement or in their families and the way silence enveloped them after they did. So it was a different story. It was the story of forging speech and having, having silence around you. And just going back enough so that you could get to new new layers in the story, often not knowing what those next layers would be. Great. Oh. Okay, now we're going to have some time. And you, you, know, you just showed us very nicely how activism comes out of daily life, you know, arises in the conflicts of daily life and the confines of daily life. But I'm also struck with how important, um, for want of a better phrase, big ideas are. We look at the slides there, you know, rights, justice, citizenship, democracy, those weren't words that people used at all 25 years ago. Or they used them to mean citizen meant somebody who had no rights, who just got run over by a truck. It's the term of police joint. Um, and so in this period of time, these words emerged in Brazil and, and, and became real to people. In a process that's still to me somewhat mysterious as to how these words became, you know, rights talk conquered the world. It's been a phenomenon of the last few decades. But, but so, so these these concepts, these ideas, these big ideas are important to people. And, and I've often found, particularly with, with women who are, are repressed at home, that they become a sphere of refuge. So, you know, um, talking about space of 
of liberation. And um, men, I found, can be quite silent in, in, that, in that realm. Mm -hmm. Although, when you shift to questions of land conflict and property, I always found that men tend to take the lead in, in that realm. But I, I think the, the big ideas are also key. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you don't disagree with that. So, so it's this intersection between between these two. And one of the ideas that struck me as so has always struck me as so crucial in Brazil is this notion of justice, which is a very Aristotelian idea that um, a difference um, that needs to be attended to uh, in a just society. You know, it's it's the idea that justice. As Aristotle put it, Hui Barbosa was famous for reiterating it that justice is treating the equal equally and the unequal unequally according to the measure of their inequality. Mm -hmm. And so, in that setup, um, prior social differences like gender or race or education um, entitle people to different treatment. And in my experience, this was very different urban working class folks, that idea that difference should, should be justly treated differently was very, very, perhaps the most difficult thing to change. And so I would get men to talk about why they wouldn't wash dishes and why it was totally unfair for their wives to do so, and they recognized that. But the Brazilian law of retirement ultimately recognized it and allowed women to retire five years early. You know, things like that. Um, so I found that this idea of a differentiated notion of justice was very deeply ingrained. And at the core of some of the problems that you, some of those contradictions that you know, you know how can people live with those contradictions? Well, they weren't really contradictory from the point of view that there are social differences. But those differences justly can be and should be given different treatments. And, and I think that's a very difficult issue in contemporary Brazil. To, uh, it's still very present and supports this older notion of citizenship in which you have a differentiated idea of the, the distribution of justice. You know, it would be really provocative to go back and explore that because my sense is we, we were, that the women we were in dialogue with wanted it, didn't want that older version of justice and were, if I think of Ivone and Vanya and where they wanted their lesbianism to be, if I think of Monica and how she wanted her household to look like, if I think of Izanetti and how she, how she confronted the psychologists and the Catholic Church and men, uh, I think they were, they were moving in a sense full speed ahead to a right to have rights and a right to have equal rights. But that's without having really explored uh, what you're what you're putting out there, and there there might be more going on in the women's uncertainty than we realized, because this wasn't a movement of women who were certain about what the future would look like. They were very uncertain about what it would actually look like to put these ideas in practice. And if we'd broadened it to talk to the men also, that would have been a really great way to to maybe get into uh, those differences. And just briefly uh, on, we tend to tell the story that this is a, a local place where this this practice and culture of opposition blossomed. It was always an interaction with big ideas and with institutions from the outside. The union, the rural union structure was one of the places where people were fighting starting in the mid-1970s and then later, uh, turning accommodationist unions into uh, unions with a different language and practice. The movement of landless people, the liberation theology church was about big ideas coming from the outside. <laughs> feminist movements uh, and feminist NGOs in Porto Alegre were an active uh, interlocutors for the women in the interior. So uh, we've in fact learned from some of our talks uh, that I, I have to figure out where that is in the book. It's there. But we, we may have be, be privileging the, the local and regional uh, and not recognizing you know, the, the ongoing interplay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. This is a great question.